But so, like I said then, the, the simple process is to add H plus S together, okay, in the consolidating, I'm trying to get this right, you add P plus S together, parent plus subsidiary, don't call it a holding company, call it a parent entity, all right? Add those two together, and then we need to make all of these adjustments, all right? What I've done, just to, to help you with the learning process, because I've got to tell you this much, all right, is that there's a lot of learning that you've got to do here. So a lot of the stuff is intuitive. A lot of it you begin to understand, all right? But I had just a comment at the break, you know, you'll start off by learning and thinking, Frip, this doesn't make any sense. And one day you'll do it and oh, it makes sense, all right? But I've got to tell you this, all right? Um, as a CTA student, you don't have time to wait for the penny to drop, eh? All right. So, you know, and I mean this, in, in the first exercise we do, all right, you'll get a question and the question is very likely to be, for 30 or 40 marks, prepare the pro forma entries to consolidate the subsidiary, all right? And then there will be various items in the fact pattern which you'll have to eliminate. So you'll have to identify which ones to eliminate and then go and do it, okay? And to do it, you need to know what to do, all right? So to help you identify, I've basically done it like this. All right, intercompany transactions, I've got the basic ones there. All right, uh, level twos in particular. What's going to happen as we go through the IFRA syllabus for the year? You're suddenly going to see that, ooh, hell, uh, that transaction, which is not on my list over here, could be an intercompany transaction, all right, and then needs to be eliminated. Okay, so understand all intercompany transactions, the effect of any transaction, between parent and subsidiary needs to be eliminated lock, stock, and barrel. Are we clear? All right. I've listed the obvious ones over there. All right. The next thing we've got there. Ro and I debated this at length, whether we should leave it in or take, or, or, or take it out. And we agreed to leave it in for the benefit of those of you that still remember something about fact three and for those of you repeating. All right. There was those entries where we had to eliminate the mark-to-market adjustments. So remember we spoke about IS-27 earlier, and I said to you, in the separates, the parent could choose the cost model, or they could reval. Right. If they revalued, we had to eliminate the revaluation. Right. And that's what these entries over here cover. All right. But much, I'm assured, to your absolute delight, all right, you're going to say, in 2018, you will not have to do that at all. For those level twos thinking ahead to changes in ownership, let me tell you, that makes your life, when I say significantly easier, it makes your life significantly easier. Okay. Okay, so we don't have to do that, but I, I honestly, we actually did consider taking it out. I thought to myself, you know what? You know, you know about it. So rather than it, it, just to say, it, you don't need to know exactly how to do it. The other thing that's going to happen this year, and the reason I'll have a look at it is I'm sure a lot of the older questions will still have that in it. So you know, at least then there's an awareness of it, and you can say, okay, I know I don't need to know that, as opposed to flipping hell, he didn't teach us that, and now I'm stupid, and whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay. Then we have um, the, call it the at acquisition entry. Uh, that's what I spoke about earlier. Remember I said to you, we need to eliminate that investment, that one-line investment. That's there. Okay. And what you guys need to know is that is all done in terms of I4S3. So it's actually like a specific standard that tells you exactly how to do that ad acquisition elimination. And then... Then we've got a process to run through for the period since acquisition to beginning of year and for the current year. Right, for those of you wondering, you know, why is it that we always break it up like that? Um, all of you have done it before. But a lot of you have done, you know, you do the analysis of equity and you don't really sort of understand anything. You just, it's like this table and that goes there and that goes there and then that goes there and that goes there. And then take this figure and copy it there and then take this figure times that percentage and put it there. And why you did all of this, you didn't really know, but... You had a nice paint-by-numbers thing and you could prepare a set of financial statements. That's no problem. 
if you require to do a set of financial statements, stick with that method. But what starts happening more at this level is they don't ask you to do the financial statements. They ask you to prepare the journal entries. Or they ask you to discuss a specific aspect with journal entries. All right. Then all of a sudden, it's not, you know, you can't go, no, no, uh, I'm not going to tell you any. I'm going to tell you what I, you know, I would have taken that number, put it on that line in that column and multiplied it by 43%. That's not going to get you any marks. Okay, so it's all got to get done in the context of I4S. So anytime you discuss, you've got to say, listen, this is the fact that I'm presented with. This is what I4S tells us to do. And therefore, I'm going to do this calculation, debit this, credit that. That's how you get marks in a discussion. Okay. You don't go, you know, in my opinion. Your opinion doesn't really count. Okay. Uh, so you state the facts, you quote the efforts, and then you give your conclusion based on that. Okay, so you'll understand we've got to drill down a bit deeper than, you know, kind of what you've learned in the past. So the only reason why you did this since acquisition to beginning of year, and it's quite important that I, I get this straight with you guys once and for all, is that you will appreciate that we're going to prepare financial statements at the reporting date, aren't we? All right? And when you prepare financial statements at a reporting date, if you think about it, there's two reporting dates because you have to do comparative figures, not so. Right, so in other words, we're going to have the current year, and can we call this the previous year? The current year and the previous year. And the reason I, we have those years is you all know from accounts one, you know that profit or loss is for the period or for the year end. Statement of changes in equity is for the year ended. So you've got to isolate those periods, not so. In other words, I've already told you that we need NCI's share of profit or loss, don't we? For what period? For that year, not so. We need a separate calculation, NCI, profit or loss, for that year. The problem you guys run into is we only acquired the subsidiary. Or we acquired the subsidiary like way back there, didn't we? So we've got this period since acquisition up until the current period. Right. The biggest joy for all of you, I've never ever seen it happen, although in practice you need to understand that it's, it's real, is we never have to give comparative figures in groups. Never. They never ask for them, which is great. Okay. So in other words, we've got to, if you think about what it is that we've got to do, we've got to deal with the current year as an isolated period, and then everything before that we've got to deal with separately. Okay, that's why when you look at your adjustments, okay, you've got to consider the adjustments that you make at the acquisition date. Then you've got to consider separately the adjustments you need to make for the period since acquisition to beginning of year. And then you need to consider separately the adjustments you need to make for the current year. Because anything that affects profit or loss for this year, you must adjust the profit or loss item, eh? revenue, cost of sales, tax expense, NCI. Where is anything that affects profit or loss from a previous year, where are you going to put it? Where's the profit from last year? Retained earnings. Same goes for other comprehensive income. If you revalue land, for example, this year, where do you see it in the financial statements? You've got statement of profit or loss and OCI, then you've got all the profit or loss stuff. Then you're adding other comprehensive income, items that get reclassified, items that do not get reclassified. This would be under the heading, they do not get reclassified. And you'd have remeasurement of land, and you've got an OCI item. But it's only for this year, hey? What if you revalued land last year, or the year before, the year before? Where's that going to be? In your revaluation surplus column in your statement of changes in equity. Okay, so you've got to appreciate stuff for the current year must be in the current year. Stuff for previous years has got to be in the opening balances in the statement of changes in equity. Because you'll appreciate any time we consolidate, what do we do? That great big spreadsheet, don't we? Okay, when do we do it? At the reporting date. So what you're going to do is you're going to go H plus S at the reporting date. 
Guys, do you understand that those H plus S figures, okay, are a summary of every transaction ever recorded by H and S? Ever, even before this date. And every year, where do you start? You start with the latest trial balance. You don't carry on from last year when you consolidate. You take the TB and you add together. Now you're going, ah, oh, it doesn't comply with Ephraim. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, group one, adjustments do we need to make? We need to make all the adjustments starting from acquisition to the beginning of year, current year. Every year you go through the same process. You don't take last year's figures and build on those because last year's trial balance is a completely different set of financial statements to this year's. Not so. Every year you start from scratch. So every year you have ad acquisition, beginning of year, and current year. Are you with me? All right. It's happened once that I can recall where a really good student once they said, give the pro forma entries to consolidate the subsidiary for the year ended, da, 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 da. So that's the way they'll ask you the question. For the year ended. And guess what she did? She did those entries just for the current year. Right. If they ask you for the entries for the year ended, what do we do every year? H plus S. So what do we need every year? You need every entry ever starting at acquisition in practice eh? you then are going to, have to isolate to beginning of the previous year then you're going to have to do the previous year and then you're going to have to do the current year you can thank the pope for small mercies you won't be asked for the previous year so your job will be going start at acquisition all the entries for the period to beginning of year all the entries for the current year okay then your spreadsheet as such will be complete. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Right, so let's run through what I've got in that material. Uh, it'll be pretty quick, and then there'll be an example for you guys to sit and do on your own kind of thing. Okay. So the introduction there, I've kind of spoken about. I'd like you to read that, though, but really what I'm saying there is that the consolidation process is H plus S, all of H plus all of S, every year, start from scratch. And then what we have to do is process this series of eliminations. All right. I've said they are pro forma adjustments, meaning they don't adjust the parent, they don't adjust the sub. The parent and the sub stay intact, don't they? And then what we do is we make these adjustments as the group accountant. Okay. You have a separate journal where you to, to, to um, keep a track of these entries, all right? And then what you'll actually end up doing, I can tell you manually what you'll end up doing, you'll put the adjustment, each adjustment in a separate column in a big Excel spreadsheet. That's what you'll end up doing. You mark my words. If you ever do consolidated financial statements, that's what you'll do, okay? So that's what just that page tells you, all right? Enter companies, I'm gonna run through fast. Okay, so if there are any questions, Put your hand up if you don't understand something. All right. But let me just say this. All right. You should know these. Where I'd like you to be now, you're saying, listen, I did this in undergrad and I know all of this stuff. All right. I appreciate some of you erased the hard drive or reformatted the hard drive after third year and you're coming in here and you're a, you're, a, you're a blank canvas. Okay. That being the case, please understand that there is no substitute for learning this stuff. All right. So when I say to you, Okay, tell me all the intercompanies you know. Right? I might be kind enough to say, how do you eliminate an intercompany loan? Right? I need you to know better than that. I need, if I said to you, yeah, jot down all the intercompanies you know, you're going to say, right, these are all the intercompanies I know, and this is the journal entry to eliminate the effect of that intercompany. Are we clear? I can show you what it is you need to learn. Okay, I can't learn it for you. Right, so please understand this stuff you have to, have to, so intercompany loans we've spoken about already we appreciate in the and it doesn't matter who's who hey so there's one thing you will see in my material over here all right there's never an a p or an s written next to the account all right so 
P could have loaned money to S or S could have loaned money to P. That doesn't matter to me. I don't care which way the transaction goes. Are we clear? The bottom line is, if there was a transaction between P or S, the effect of that transaction is going to be in your total, not so. And if it's an intercompany transaction, what do we need to do? Eliminate. I don't care if it's P, I don't care if it's S. All right. So it doesn't matter who loaned money to who. If there was an intercompany loan, one entity has a payable, the other company has a receivable, not so. Eliminate that. How do you get rid of a payable? With a debit. How do you get rid of a receivable? Okay, so that poor bugger that taught you debits and credits and accounts 101. All right? I hope you paid attention. Just take note, those payables and receivables do not just apply to loans payable, loans receivable. Right? There could be dividends payable, receivable. That's commonplace, eh? So a dividend has been declared, not paid. You understand the one company's got a dividend receivable, the other company's got a dividend payable. Okay? They don't knock each other out. The one is under current assets, the other is under current liabilities. The journal entry to get rid of them is debit the payable, credit the receivable. Okay. Debtors, creditors, current accounts, financial assets and financial liabilities at amortized cost. I punted that for this year's ITC. It didn't come up. Okay. Listen to me. CTA students, okay. In undergrad, where you had the loan payable was 100 grand and the loan receivable was 100 grand, you know, and, they, and it was interest free and some nonsense like that, all right? That nonsense doesn't exist in postgrad, okay? So please, at one point, we're going to learn to account for financial assets at amortized cost, financial liabilities at amortized cost. You need to know what to do with transaction costs, first day gains and losses. You need to know how to work out the effect of interest rate, which ironically is not the same for the asset and the liability. But you appreciate that eliminating an intercompany transaction means you've got to undo the transaction, eh? And how do you do that? You've got to know what happened in the transaction. So you're going to have to run through, okay, this is what the parent did, that's what the sub did, then undo it. Okay, the other big one that's going to be happening, okay, is going to be, Leases. There's a brand new standard on leases. Okay? People, it is commonplace in a group that sometimes the parent is the lessor and the sub is the lessee. That's a transaction between parent and sub. What do you need to do with it? Eliminate it. So the rule of thumb is eliminate all intercompany transactions. And I can tell you this much, okay, where you guys sit now, you name the transaction. You guys have got, what is it, five odd thousand pages of IFRS teaching you how to deal with an untold number of transactions. Okay, you name the transaction. It could be an intercompany transaction. I'll put one in here as well, which we'll have to have a look at sometime, is IP PPE. Normally, investment property is property that's rented out, eh? Ah, and then it's investment property. Now, the parent rents the property to a subsidiary. In the parent's books, it's investment property. At group level, the property is owner occupied by a member of the group, eh? And one of the requirements for investment property is it's not allowed to be owner occupied. So you're going to have to un investment property the investment property and PPE the investment property. All right. So just to give you insight, at this stage, those funny little ones, we're not going to look at. Right. But what will happen during the year is we will look at those transactions. And then level twos in particular, I'm going to have to say to you, okay, now that we've done the transaction, we've done sale and lease back transactions, what if that was an intercompany transaction? And then you need to think about what would the pro forma journal entry be? To eliminate that. Okay. Okay, so I've just been asked about one of those questions. I mean, typically this one over here. And I intimated earlier that the asset and the liability wouldn't be the same. 
I think premature for me to go into that now, if you don't mind. Okay, but let me just say this. Right. If they don't balance, and you don't know what to do with the other side of the transaction, I hope that doesn't happen, because I hope we will deal with these as the year goes on. Right, but when in doubt, put the balancing figure in retained earnings. Okay, you're probably right about half the time. Better than not balancing a, an entry, eh? I saw a funny thing on Facebook the other day. This guy posted something. He said, he's met this girl. And he said, I knew she was too old for me when she referred to her statement of financial position as a balance sheet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you've got an intercompany loan, okay, and there is interest on that loan, you better eliminate the interest. Not so. All right. So get rid of the interest income. How do you get rid of income? With a debit. How do you get rid of an expense? With a credit. And then, just as we follow from that, that would apply to any intercompany incomes and expenses. Okay, so I spoke about the investment property. One is paying rent to the other, not so. Eliminate the rent. If there's commissions payable between the two companies, eliminate those, management fees, whatever they may be. Eliminate all intercompany income and expenses, obviously by debiting the relevant income item and crediting the expense. Okay, and then just use the proper terminology. All right, so what you may find is if the income is admin expenses, then call it admin expenses. Okay, so just be a little bit more specific about that. And as I said earlier, at CTA level, if you leave those little designations out, all right, they don't mark the entry. Well, you might be lucky, they might mark your figures, but there's always a half and a half for that. You will lose the half and half, eh? All right. And then if the examiner is being a hard ass, okay, they'll just say, and in that case, I'm not marking the numbers either. All right. But do you think it's fair or not? Doesn't really matter. All right. So just never leave out your OCIs, SFPs, SCEs, and PLs. Just they are always in there. All right. Then we look at the good old. If it's intercompany sales that we're talking about, uh, debit the income, credit the expense. One company's sale is the other company's purchase, not so. Where's the sale? In revenue. Where's the purchase? It's going to be in cost of sales. All right. Easy peasy. Uh, make a note to yourselves there. That is with 100%, with all of the sales for the whole year. Then we deal with the scenario where some of the sales from one company to the other company is still left on hand in the inventory of the purchaser. All right. So let's just have a quick look at a little example there just to make sure. And honestly, you should have done this in second year. So if I'm boring you, I do apologize. All right. But what I, I need to know, if this comes up in an exam, you're going to get 100%. And let me tell you, I've seen this come up in ITC for eight marks. Okay. Six out of eight is not a good mark. Seven out of eight is not a good mark. If you don't get eight out of eight, you should be drawn and courted. Okay. Do you know what that means? You know, in the old days, it was a punishment. You had an oak here, and they should tie a rope around each limb. I swear, and then they used to get those oxen that um, plow the lands, and they just pull the oak apart. So they would draw you in different directions, and then you would end up in quarters. The head would end up with one part. and It's not a perfect quarter, but it would be pretty messy. So that is the punishment for not knowing your intercompany transaction. Okay, so let's just assume there is between P and S. We have a, an intercompany sale. Let's, for argument's sake, say it is from P to S. Let me just reiterate, I don't care from who to who. Eh? P to S, S to P, same thing. Makes no difference. The question is, is it intercompany? The answer is yes. So let's say the sale is for 100000 If you pick that up in a question, what is your pro forma? You're going to debit revenue, credit cost of sales, PLPL, PL, 100000 and 100000 
Okay. Probably worth two marks that entry. That's the point. If you don't get those two marks, okay, what then? Then this company sells some of that inventory to third parties, not so. Okay? And then by virtue of the fact they've sold it to a third party, can you see the resulting effect that we've achieved here? So we've then got the intercompany transaction has been eliminated. You got it? But the sale that has gone from S to outside the group, that's going to be in S's sales. Okay? And it's going to be in our consolidated financial statements, which is correct. But let's say they only sold 70% of that inventory. That means 30% of that inventory is still on hand, doesn't it? Okay, and it's in their records at how much? 30,000. Because you'll appreciate they bought it. So in their, in their separate financial statements, they don't account for the relationship with P. S is its own company, isn't it? So how do we record the inventory? At cost. What was the cost? 100,000. All right, so now we've got 30,000 left on hand. And when you add H plus S together, where are you going to see that? In inventory, not so, at 30,000. You will also appreciate, though, that when S, sorry, when P made the sale, they made sale to another company, not so. They probably didn't sell it at cost. Let's assume their cost of sales, the cost of the stock that they sold to S was... For example, 75,000. Can you see they made a profit of 25,000? Eh? Can you see that their GP percentage is 25%? Can you see that their markup is 33 and a third percent? Or let's put it another way. Can you see that the inventory did not cost the group 100,000? When this inventory came from outside the group to inside the group, what did it cost the group? 75. How much of that inventory is left? In the group, 30% of it. What's 30% of 75,000? 22,500? Check my arithmetic quickly. So 22,500 is left in the group. But if you go back to brass tax and you say H plus S, where is the inventory? It's in S, isn't it? What's it sitting at? 30,000. Is that correct? Listen to me carefully. Is that correct from S's perspective? Yes. Is that correct from the group's perspective? No. IS2, your standard on inventory, tells you, let's forget about NRV, tells you that inventory must be measured at cost. And I'll ask you this question. What was the cost of the inventory when it came from outside the group to inside the group? What was the cost to the group? 75 times the 30% that's left, not so. 22,500. So what do you need to do? Can you tip X out the 30,000? No. So what do you do? You've got a credit inventory, 7,500. That's how you make inventory smaller, eh? And that's an SFP account. And the other side of the entry? You've just changed the value of your closing stock, haven't you? All right. If you make your closing stock bigger, you'll make your cost of sales smaller, if you make your closing stock smaller, you'll make your cost of sales bigger. I don't need, don't even analyze that, for goodness sake. You can all see you have to make the inventory smaller, not so. The other side of the entry will affect cost of sales in profit or loss. Okay. Right, so any time, and it's not just going to be inventory, any time any asset is in the group, and it contains an internal markup. You've got to get rid of that markup. Eh? We call that markup an unrealized profit. In other words, one company made a profit out of another company in the group. If that asset is still on hand, you need to eliminate that unrealized profit.
not just with inventory, any asset. Okay. Next question. If that entry happened in a previous year, what do we do? Do you need to process that entry for the previous year, or can we just leave it alone? You need to process it. Remember I said to you, you always start at acquisition. If that was 20 years ago, okay, then you go back and you've got to look at all the transactions for the last 20 years. So you still need to process that entry, eh? even if it happened five years ago. Does the entry look the same? The answer is no. Because if that entry happened five years ago, where's the profit from five years ago? In the opening balance of retained earnings, which is the statement of changes in equity account. Okay. We're going to have a look at my notes there quickly. Remembering the penalty, if you don't know them. So starting at the bottom over here, if there is inventory on hand that includes a markup from another company, all right, eliminate that unrealized profit. Debit cost of sales, credit, inventory. If that entry or if that transaction happened in a previous year, eliminate it in a previous year. <clears throat> there could be one that happened in a previous year, one that happened this year. Then you'd have both, do you understand? Different amounts, but you'd have both entries. And then a the little bit that ah, confuses, not confuses, but just irritates a few people, is that the entry from the previous year needs to be reversed this year. The argument being that any unrealized profit or any inventory on hand last year would have been sold to a third party this year. Not so. so you do reverse last year's entry this year. And then a whole lot of students turn around and they say, yeah, but then you could have just left that entry out completely. That's not true. Look at them carefully. The unrealized profit last year affects last year's profit, affects retained earnings. When you reverse that entry this year, last year's closing stock is this year's opening stock. This year's opening stock affects this year's cost of sales, which is in profit or loss this year. So you might have done it in previous years. I have no issue if you want to do it as a net entry. If you just have a look there, the net effect of that entry is debit retained earnings, credit cost of sales. Because those are the same number. Eh? So eliminate your unrealized profit from last year, last year, retained earnings. Reverse that entry this year, cost of sales. Okay. Completely separate calculation, eliminate the unrealized profit in inventory this year. Okay. Now, you will also see that the entries that we processed in the current year, or the entries that we processed here, you will see <coughs> the effects SFP, financial position, and the other side of the entry affects profit or loss. Wherever you have SFP, profit or loss, or SFP, OCI, you're going to have a tax effect. Consider this quickly. When we eliminated the intercompany loan, all right, just think about it quickly. Carrying amount, tax base, SMP difference, deferred tax. At group level, we had a loan payable, loan receivable. The carrying amount we said was 100,000. And what you're going to find when we've done income taxes is the tax base is 100,000. Tempe difference is null, deferred tax is null. Okay, so there was no deferred tax before. And then what we do we cross out that, which means we don't have to work out that. And what's the deferred tax? Still null, not so. 
So simply put, if you have an entry, a pro forma entry, where you debit SFP, credit SFP, what is the net effect on SFP? Nil. So what is the net effect on deferred tax? Nil. Likewise, if your entry is profit or loss, profit or loss, what's the net effect on SFP? Because remember, you work out deferred tax, where there's a difference between the carrying amount and the tax base of an asset or a liability. Yeah. Does that entry affect the carrying amount or tax base of any asset or liability? No. So there's going to be no deferred tax. Get it? Okay. Where you have carrying amount, tax base, temporary difference, deferred tax. Let's do our little example. We had inventory, 30,000. The tax base is 30,000. Okay. Section 22 of the Income Tax Act basically tells you that the tax man accepts the entity's tax valuation. Okay. The entity being our company S. What was the inventory in their books? It was 30,000. What does SARS accept? 30,000. So we've got no temporary difference and we've got no deferred tax. All right. Now, we processed an entry, didn't we? We went and eliminated, was it seven and a half grand? I think so. <clears throat> and we made that 22,500. Guys, SARS does not do group financial statements. SARS taxes P. SARS taxes S. So SARS doesn't make any adjustment. So what do we end up with? 7,500. Give me 28%. Quick, quick. Say again. 2,100. And your carrying amount is smaller than your tax base for an asset. So we need to create a deferred tax asset. So the journal entry, <clears throat> debit deferred tax, SFP, and credit your tax expense in profit or loss. 2100, 2100. Okay, that's the logic. <clears throat> Truthfully, you can get away with, you know, if you if you under exam conditions and that sort of thing, you can get away with just simply this. First of all, you're looking to see if that's SFP and that's SFP, what have I told you? No tax. If that's PL, no tax. Okay. If one's SFP and the other one's PL, if one's SFP and the other one's OCI, if one's SFP and the other one's statement of changes in equity then there's tax. So if they're the same, just ignore it. If they're different, then there's tax. And the tax will always work like this. It works with an opposite. Okay, so if you credit SFP there, you debit SFP there. If you debit the statement of changes in equity there, you credit the statement of changes in equity there. Always. Check it out. Debit SFP, so you made the carrying amount bigger. That will create a deferred tax liability. You credit profit or loss, eh? More profit? There should be more tax expense, eh? How do you get more tax expense? You debit your tax expense in profit or loss. All right. Um, I'm always very particular about calling it the deferred tax expense. All right. Just take note, UNISA in your study material will just call it literally tax expense, profit or loss. Okay. Use UNISA's designations for UNISA's exams. Okay. Check it out. Credit SFP. So... If you make your carrying amount smaller for an asset, you'll create a deferred tax asset. Did you really need to know that? No, you just need to know my little 
criss cross rule that will always work. Okay. I said already we eliminate intercompanies for all. We eliminate, sorry, unrealized profit regardless of the asset. It doesn't matter if the asset is inventory or the asset is something else. In this case, I'm dealing with property, plant, and equipment. All right? So the first bit of it is you can use the same figures even, okay, if you like. Or maybe it would be smart to use slightly different figures. So in this case, what we're assuming, old dog, new tricks, the parent, and let's say they had PP&E in their records of 75,000, okay? They sold the PP&E for 100,000, happy? Therefore, they made a profit on disposal of 25. Do you eliminate that profit on disposal? Only if it's intercompany. Okay? So don't like going, otherwise you'll end up eliminating freaking everything. Then consolidations is really easy. Because then the answer looks like this. Like that. Okay. Okay, so I'm saying it's an intercompany. It was P sold to S. So if it's intercompany, then we need to eliminate. How do we eliminate? It always looks the same. All right. The SFP item is overstated, isn't it? It's been marked up. Get rid of the markup. And get rid of the profit or loss. How much did we say that was? 25,000. All right. Now just give it a name. What's the asset? What's the asset in this example? Is it inventory? No. It's pp &E. Okay, so let's call it pp &E. and And pp and &E, we always have in two bits, don't we? Cost less accumulated depreciation. This affects the cost, doesn't it? Okay. Because the cost was marked up. All right? And profit on sale of pp and &E, where's that going to be? Call it that. Okay, it's going to be in profit or loss. Yes, but be specific. You're not going to get a mark for that entry. So... Profit or loss on disposal. So if you want to call it profit on disposal of pp and &E, I'm happy. All right. If you're in any doubt whatsoever, just ask yourself, what line item in the statement of profit or loss would that profit or loss be? It would be in your other income. Okay. So maybe the safest bet is to call it other income, and then in brackets, right, profit on disposal. Okay. That way you're sure to get the marks. It's not, I mean, how hard is that? Easy. If that happened in a prior year, do you still need the entry yes or no? Yes. Except, what are you going to call that? Good. Retained earnings. Does that need tax? Yes or no? Yes. And what does the tax look like? Debit, SFP, credit, profit or loss. Okay. It's deferred tax. It's never going to be SARS. SARS doesn't do this nonsense. Okay? And then the tax expense is going to be literally that. Tax expense, you call it. Okay? I'm a bit more anal about that because if you actually have to prepare a proper set of financial statements with notes, which you guys are never expected to do, you know as well as I do, you've got to split between tax, current, and deferred. Not so. So actually... Practically, it's no good. Tax expense, which part of it? Which component? Current or deferred? And that's going to be at the tax rate. Quick, quick, 28%? 7,000. Thank you. All right. Eliminate the unrealized profit. The asset here is PPE. The asset we looked at previously was inventory, hey? So what I said to you was eliminate the unrealized profit on the item that was on the transaction. Agreed. And then what happened after that? You saw what I did after that is I realized the profit. It might not have been obvious to you, but you will recall that what we did over here, in the wrong way, that, 
I was going the right way. We said, if the sale happened in a previous year, eliminate the profit in a previous year. Hey. Then the assumption I made was, that inventory has now been sold. Hey. How do you use inventory? You sell it. Okay? And when you use the inventory, when you sell it, you realize the profit. Look carefully. Can you see that entry there made your profit smaller in a previous year? Then when you sell it, you're simply realizing. You're making, you're earning that unrealized profit. Makes your profit bigger, not so. So tell me, how do you use TP&E? Well, you use it, don't you, over time. And as you use it over time, what do we do with it? We depreciate it. And if you look at this over here, you're going to see, let's just, let's just use five years, nice and simple. What is the depreciation on that? 20,000. What is the depreciation on that? 15,000. Tell me this, where is this asset physically? It's in here, isn't it? At 100,000. So what are they, they doing in their own books? They depreciate it, aren't they? What they depreciating? But hundred thousand, aren't they? So their depreciation on that is twenty thousand. What have we just done in that entry over there? We just reduced this. We've said, listen, at group level, at group level, we're saying it's not a hundred; it is seventy-five. How do we achieve that? We went debit the profit, credit the asset, didn't we? Okay, you're going to look very stupid. In the group financial statements, if you say cost of the asset is 75,000, depreciation rate is five years, and my depreciation is 20,000. Like some acting accountants, and at six can tell you that that's wrong. Sorry, grade eight. So, what are you going to do? If you make the asset smaller, what have you got to do? Make the depreciation on the asset smaller. We can see quite clearly the difference is. 5,000. You don't have to do that calculation. You can simply do it like this. Can you all see you've made the asset smaller by 25? All right. If you make the asset smaller, you've got to make the depreciation smaller. Debit accumulated depreciation, credit depreciation, profit or loss. Okay. And then be specific. Where would the depreciation be in profit or loss? Depends. Okay, you're in CTA now, you're not in undergrad. All right. If it's a manufacturing item, cost of sales. If it's a delivery bucky, distribution, selling and distribution expenses. If it's a photocopier, admin expenses. If it's some other asset, other expenses. Okay. And if you reduced the asset by 25,000, you've got to de reduce the depreciation by depreciation on that. What is our depreciation, we say? Over five years. Okay. Tax, yes or no? Yes. Debit, profit or loss, credit, SFP. Tax on that? One, four, eh? Hey? DT, SFP, tax expense, profit or loss. Okay. And to the extent that any of that happened in a previous year, because think about it, you could have sold the asset three years ago, not so. Then the sale happened in a previous year, retained earnings. The tax is in, retained earnings. Then what have you got? You've got the next year's depreciation, which is still a previous year. Retain earnings. Then you have the next year's depreciation, which is still in a previous year. Retain earnings. Then you have this year's depreciation, which is profit or loss of this year. So the whole principle, you go back to whenever the asset was sold, eh? <clears throat> and you do your entries from then until now. When I say until now, current year in the current year. Previous years, you can do one entry for all the previous years lumped together. And then there's a, there's a cool old trick that UNISA like to do. Not just UNISA, 
ITC's done it, UJ loved it. So there's a high probability it comes up in your exam. There's a reasonable probability it comes up in ITC. But I think I've dealt with the principles already. So it's the same little example in the sense that we've got the parent sells an asset to the sub. Bear in mind, it could be the other way around. Okay? And an asset that cost 75000 was sold for 100000 realizing a profit of twenty five. <clears throat> because it's intercompany, it needs to be eliminated. All right. Now, let's say that that asset is a delivery vehicle. Okay, so that's the asset. It's a delivery vehicle. But in the question, they tell you that P is a car dealer. What is the asset as far as P is concerned? Inventory. S is just a normal retail entity that delivers inventory now and again. What is the asset as far as S is concerned? PPE, &E, hey. All right. So I've said already that where we have unrealized profit in inventory, we need to get rid of the profit and we need to correct the asset. Right, this is where common sense comes in. Maybe the easiest place to start because it has a physical presence. Where is the asset? I said to you that P sold to S. Eh? So where is the asset? Physically, it's sitting in here. And what are they calling the asset? pp &E. So if the asset's there, who sold the asset? Pete sold the asset. Correct. Okay. They sold the asset. They sold inventory. Hey, where is that profit? It's in two places, revenue and cost of sales. And there they would have had revenue of 100,000 and cost of sales of 75. All right, so do it. See, so whether they ask you for journal entries or whether they ask you for uh, financial statements, I can tell you now, it's going to be a half and a half for the description, and it's going to be a half and a half for the amount. Alternatively, if you're doing a set of financial statements, okay, what you need to do is H plus S, eh? and S is going to include, or the parent, sorry, is going to include, so we've got to go minus 100, for which that give you a mark, and minus 75 which they would give you a mark. So either way, there's two marks on offer. If you go debit other income, 25,000, you lose both your marks. Do you understand? Your profit's correct still, isn't it? Your net profit is going to be right. That's not what this is about. Okay, You've got to show, present the financial statements in such a way that the line item revenue, which is part of that profit, and the line item cost of sales, which is part of that profit, has got to be correct. You've got to be very, very specific about these things. Okay. And then where's the asset? If you call this inventory, you lose that mark. Do you understand? Your SFP still balances whether you put that credit in inventory, deferred tax, investment property, or PP&E. You're still going to balance. Not so. All right. The only way you get the mark is if you credit the line item, property, plant, and equipment. Okay, that's in the year of the sale. What happens after this? I've already said to you, you better believe it. If you eliminate unrealized profit in one year, that unrealized profit is going to be realized in subsequent years, one way or another. So you better believe if we eliminated the profit, which was to credit SFP debit profit, in a subsequent year, we're going to have debit SFP and credit profit or loss. It's a fact. 
how and at what rate and when? Well, what's the asset? PPE. How do we use PPE? Over time. Debit, accumulated depreciation, credit, depreciation. Every year, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. Do you need tax for the first entry? Yes, you do. I know you can do it. Do you need tax for the second entry? Yes, you do. I know you can do it. One more. Then you can take another quick break. P sells to S for 100,000. An asset which is in their books at 75. They make a profit of 25. S is a second-hand car dealer. P is a delivery company, or P is a normal retailer, and three, three or four years, they get rid of their cars and they buy a new fleet. Are you with me? Okay. So the carrying amount of the asset in P's books is 75. Maybe let's make your lives a little bit harder. In their books, this was made up of cost, 200,000, accumulated depreciation, 125. That's how we get our 75,000. Okay. So company P sells a used delivery vehicle to company S for 100,000. For company P, the asset was PPE, eh? For company S, the asset is inventory. Okay, three minutes. Give me all the entries. Go. All right, so eliminate the unrealized profit. Obviously, we debit the profit or loss. We credit SFP. The line item. So that question is, where is the asset? It's in S, eh? And what's it called? Inventory. So we need to correct our inventory. 25,000. Who sold the asset? P. What did they call that? Profit. They would have called it profit on disposal, eh? Because they were selling PPE. You don't put profit on disposal of PPE in revenue, do you? No. So it's going to be other income. In subsequent periods, what do we do with that inventory? Great. We realize it, eh? Okay, we'd sell it, in other words. And when we sell it, what would you do? Debit inventory credit. Cost of sales, eh? So you don't depreciate inventory over time. You get rid of inventory, lock, stock, and barrel when? When you sell it. All right. Which means then we would need to get rid of that. The inventory's gone now. You don't need that anymore. All right. 25,000. 25,000. Do you need tax on the entry? Yes, you do. Okay. Can you do it? Yes, you can. All right. So the first entry would be debit DT SFP, credit tax expense profit loss, and then obviously the opposite for the second entry. So normally what would happen if this was given to you in an exam is this would have happened in a previous year and then it sold in the current year. All right. Like I've said again, I've said a few times already, to the extent that any of this happens in a previous year, it's not going to affect profit or loss, is it? It's going to affect the opening balance on retail earnings in the statement of changes in equity. With that, you can have a 15-minute break. Sorry, 14 minutes. It's 10.16. I will start again at 10.30.